Anna, and uh, let's have a look together at our um, basic negative staining protocol for screening particulate samples. Uh, first of all, the sample itself. Uh, we typically have quite small amounts that we keep safe on ice in most cases. We have an ice machine in the lab, so we work on it to that if necessary. Uh, and for the negative staining, we typically start with urinal acetate 2% stock solution, which is filtered in these little, filtered and stored in these little tubes here in the fridge, which are protected with aluminium foil as they are very light sensitive. So the solution will precipitate when exposed to light. Uh, what I can start with now is by actually spinning down uh, the solution so that if there are any precipitates left uh, after the previous user, uh, they will basically uh, end up at the bottom of the tube and we end up with nice clear solution at the top. So here we have one and a half mil. I take a counter weight tube and I spin this down for two minutes at, ma at maximum speed. So I'll put the rest in the fridge so it's not getting exposed to light. And in the meantime, I'm just going to prepare my workspace. So we try to work on this metal tray so that we can contain the contamination as much as possible. Uh, urinal acetate is very toxic. Uh, it's a heavy metal. So we really, really have to strive to avoid contaminating the bench and the tray as well, but if anything is better, if it ends up here, then here. Uh, we protect the metal tray with some paracoon, and depending on how many droplets you're going to have, you need a bigger or a smaller piece. I just have one sample here, and I'm going to do a very simple protocol, so it's enough with a little square like this. And I can affix it to the, to the, to the work tray, just with some water, hot water is okay. I'm going to stick it on with the water bottle so that it off. And with some tissue tape, we kind of iron it out so that it sticks well. And that's good and stable for a while. And then we can remove the paper. So I have very fine forceps here, they are biological grade, uh, so these are best for handling uh, grids which are very fine and thin. Uh, so you are uh, you're welcome to ask us for some tips about where to purchase good forceps like this. You can already aliquot a droplet of our sample uh, from the tube. Uh, and now it depends. If you prefer your sample to warm up to room temperature, then you can do it now. If you prefer your sample to be cold for as long as possible, then we can do it after we've taken care of the support plates. I tend to use 20 microliter droplets. You can use less if your sample is very precious. I'm just going to leave it here and it will cover it with a petri dish so there's no dust falling in there. And I, what I'm going to do now is take care of the support grids mm. on which we're going to sort of mount our particles, so to speak. We are going to pre-treat our grids before we um, expose them to our sample. So the treatment is called flow discharge and we typically run an in-air flow discharge program which does not require any chemical uh, to be applied uh, to our grids. So I'm going to turn on the glow cube, which is our glow discharge machine from Forum. 
And in the meantime, while I'm waiting for the interface to load, I can pick up one grid. I don't know if you can see the outline of the form worm fill, which is kind of this shiny rectangle here. It's an extremely thin foil of plastic like polymer that coats the mesh on the grids. And I'm first going to score around the grid to interrupt the film so that I don't drag more than one grid with me. And then I just lift it. And I place it, place it on a support, a little bit support plate here. Like that. With the film facing up, this is very important. Because, of course, this is the side that we want to expose to the treatment. Uh, I typically do at least two replicate grids per example, because you never know one can turn out better than the other. It's always good to have a replicate. In case anything looks weird, you can always double check uh, on the second grid. Uh, then what happens is that we open this chamber. And we have to pop in the metal tray with the grid in there. So I'm just going to do this with gloves on so that I don't contaminate the tray with the grease from my hands. We want to keep everything as clean as possible inside the chamber. Lift it gently so we don't drop the grids and just place it there in the middle, like that. Uh, and now I'm going to go into the air clean menu. And for hydrophilic negatively char charged grids, uh, we currently have a program called test. Uh, we can open it here and you can see that it's, um, you can see the parameters of the program, so to speak. Uh, so it runs for 15 seconds and the current is 20 milliampers. You can create your custom programs, uh, but let's start with this. This is kind of a gold standard that mo mo works for most uh, samples. So I just come out and I press the green triangle to start the program. There we go. And we can see how the vacuum inside the machine is uh, improving. So we want to pump out air from the chamber first, and then in a controlled way, allow some air into the chamber again, creating a plasma. And it's the, the plasma that modifies the properties of the support plate. You can see that the requested current is 20 milliampers and the measured current for now is zero milliampers. It's good to keep an eye on that in case anything weird happens, uh, in case your sample looks weird, it's good to be sure that the program ran as it should be. So it's good to keep an eye on it while it's running. So I also said that we're gonna obtain a negatively charged hydrophilic grid. This is true, but here you can see polarity positive. This is a different parameter. This is to do with the polarity of the source of the plasma. Uh, so these are two independent parameters. So now we can see here it's saying bleeding gas, 70%. So that it is really spinning. That just means that uh, air is let into the chamber again in a controlled manner. We need some air particles inside the chamber to create the plasma. And now if you look down, you can see the plasma itself. You can also see a bunch of sparks kind of flying around. This is, this is normal. This is nothing to be worried about. And it says process completed and we just click confirm OK.
and it should have automatically vented. So now, yes, now I can open it in there and take out my little support uh, platform with the grid. Okay, and now we can place the grid onto the sample. I typically start with two minutes incubation, and there are two ways you can do this. You can place the grid onto the droplet, which is in paraffin, but you can also hold the grid in the forceps and secure it like this in the forceps, um, close the forceps with a little secure rubber and keep the grid in the forcep and then apply a droplet to the grid with, uh, with the um, pipette. But I, I prefer to do it on the paraffin. So that's how I'm gonna do it. So remember that the support film is facing up and we have to flip it now so that it faces down towards the sample. And we just leave it like this and start the timer, two minutes. Okay, so the sample has been incubating for over one and a half minutes now. Uh, we hope now that the particles are attached nicely to the uh, support film, uh, which they do by being of static interactions. Uh, the urinal is still in the little centrifuge, so I'm just gonna pop it out. And I'll equip a little droplet. Again, I tend to use 20 microliters, but you can use less. Pop it in here for now, that's quite dark there. And I use a very simple protocol where I just blot off the excess of the suspension with our particle. Sorry, I'll place it down for a moment again. I will set this to uh, 10 seconds first for the staining. You can see the sample droplet there on the grid, I hope. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow blot it off by touching the grid to the filter paper vertically so that the so that the solution kind of runs off from the grid uh, and you want as little solution as possible left. Uh, the angle is uh, quite important here. Uh, I will talk about that uh, later. So basically by modifying the angle you can sort of play around with the amount of stain that stays on the grid and embeds the particles. So the contrast, so to speak. Okay, so I just touch it against the filter paper. The stain runs off and I place it immediately down on the stain and start 10 seconds on the timer. I place, place the filter paper on the parafilm because now I'm gonna blot off the urinal and I really don't want the urinal to come and co uh, contaminate the tray. So I do the same again, I pick it up and just let the stain get absorbed by the filter paper. And now I can just simply air dry the grid facing up with the sample side. If you place it down now, you basically damage your sample. So you have to be focused and remember which side was which. So this part is actually probably the most difficult. Uh, and I would suggest that you start with practicing just with an empty grid uh, we can give you old grids for practicing, which are not very expensive. Um, so what you have to do is you have to open the forceps without the grid getting sort of sucked into them, because there is a tiny amount of liquid there between the tips of the forceps. And if you just simply open the forceps tips now, the grid will get sort of sucked in and the, film, the support film will get destroyed, at least partly. So what we need to do here is push out the grid so we have to be pushing with the filter paper through the tip while gently opening the forceps. I really hope I don't embarrass myself now and that it goes well, because it can really be quite tricky sometimes. There we go. So that went well. Yeah, and now we need to let this air dry. So you can put a little Petri dish on top so there's no dust sedimenting around the, in the grid. So this was our simplest protocol. 
there are different steps you can add. So for example, certain users wash the sample uh, or wash the grid uh, to remove excess sample from the support film uh, by applying one, two or three droplets of water to the grid. Uh, I tend to start like this and then uh, you can think of modifying uh, your protocol. You can also add a step where you fix your sample uh, with an aldehyde fixative so that it's more stable on the grid. Uh, so we typically do that with formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde. So again, you apply a droplet of glutaraldehyde or formaldehyde to the grid after the, uh, after the particle uh, has been applied. Uh, you can use this extractor uh, of a bench extractor here if you're working with uh, aldehydes. So you can then just lower it and have your workspace uh, on this bench. Uh, but what I need to do now, while I'm uh, waiting for the grid to dry, is clean up. And here we have a drawer with these containers for both liquid urinal acetate and solid waste. So anything contaminated with urinal that can be put in the liquid waste. So first of all, I take care of the little piece of tissue paper which I pop into the solid waste and I will do the same with paraffin uh, with the paraffin piece in a little bit but first I want to uh, now you want to be really careful not to spill this on the bench and uh, what is actually a really good idea is to use a secondary container which will prevent that from happening for example this little glass bag pop in the bottle like this it's not volatile, so it's okay to open it on the back beach for a short amount of time. Uh, and oh yes, that's right, you don't need to bite. So we are going to suck up this chocolate of urine now. And pop it into the liquid waste bottle. And the tip goes here. And so does the paraffin, I just need to take all this stuff now. There we go. We close this, we don't leave it standing here on the bench. And we pop it back into the drawer. And we just Uh, so most of the visible liquid is gone from it, but it's too early to put it in the microscope. We need to let it uh, continue to dry properly, and we recommend at least 30 minutes before we put it into the microscope. Uh, so just consider that when you're planning to uh, stain before your imaging session, that you need to give the grid some time to dry. Okay. I'm going to pick up my grid and put it in a grid box. of course like this and it just stands there vertically and the, the the surfaces of the grid do not touch any of the walls inside the box so it can continue drying in there it's not airtight so it, it's uh, it's safe there and it can continue drying 